And um, I want to introduce quickly the Community Engagement Forum. Um, we are the ones organizing these sessions. Um, a lot of you are members already, which is great. Um, we're an online interagency community of practice on engaging displaced populations um, in humanitarian response. Um, um, and our purpose is to share um, resources and experiences and guidance and challenges and advice on engaging communities in displacement response. Um, and one of the ways we do that is through these monthly community coffee and chat sessions where we um, where we discuss topical um, issues brought brought to us by you, by the community engagement for members. Um, and today we will um, share with you um, or we, we will bring in experts who will share with you their experiences uh, on um, planning and implementing community led projects. Um, and uh, before before we do that, I just want to uh, remind everyone that some of our colleagues are celebrating Ramadan. So maybe today we'll, if you have your camera on, we can focus on the chat instead of the coffee. Um, and uh, um, also I want to introduce Ruxandra um, from UNHCR's global uh, CCCM team in Geneva, and she will um, she'll introduce this session for you. So if it's OK, I will uh, hand over to you now, Roxandra, and I can see if I can get hold of Walid. Thank you, Kristen, and hello again, everyone. Um, <clears throat> I believe uh, most of us uh, know each other here, but if not, um, my name is Roxandra. I work for the Global CCCM cluster. And just to put things a little bit into context, as um, most of you may know, the uh, this session is part of the Community Engagement Forum, which is part of the Global CCCM cluster. <clears throat> As such, um, this community of practice works with us um, at the global cluster level and um, our practitioners uh, more broadly. Although, of course, as you may know, it has a bit of a wider scope and looks at community engagement um, from an overall perspective. So while the examples that you will hear of today are related to, to CCCM in particular, um, this can be applied, of course, in other um, sectoral interventions as well. Um, but to bring it back to the CLP um, tip sheet and guidance, and to give you a little bit of uh, background on uh, the document itself um, and how it came about and, and what its purpose is. <clears throat> I would like to just thank also the colleagues that have worked on it. Um, its formulation was uh, part of a wide consultation uh, led by the Community Engagement Forum through Kristen specifically. Um, <clears throat> with with most of uh, the colleagues um, present here today and, and some others as well, primarily practitioners. Um, so while I am, of course, speaking on behalf of the global cluster, which you know is a coordination forum platform, a coordination mechanism, um, we're referring here primarily to the actual implementation of, uh, of a participation mechanism um, that can be rolled out of course, one of the many, but a very important one that can be rolled out through CCCM programs. Now, the fact that we're discussing this is very important because community led projects are one of the most difficult um, aspects <clears throat> or modalities of participation that we can uh, do through CCCM, but it does um, have very specific dividends on uh, community participation, but not just participation, actual ownership. So as you may know, CCCM intrinsically has the mandate to work with the communities. We serve a bit more hands on um, and include them in all of our processes and um, um, conversations with regards to needs assessments, connecting them with a the humanitarian community and so on. You're, you're more, most, most familiar with these processes, but um, <clears throat> to add to that, 
um, in recent years, many agencies at uh, the implementation level have tried and tested successfully now um, this specific modality of community-led projects, which has a bit of a nuance to it with respect to the fact that um, the projects are designed, um, chosen, needs identified, um, and so on by the community, and then the implementation is in fact supported by the CCCM agencies in this case, but, uh, but the projects are primarily um, of the community. So um, while they, uh, these projects receive support and the community itself receives support, and that can take many shapes, as you'll see in the document, um, these specific aspects are very much attributed to, to the community themselves. They manage um, the processes and the, um, every aspect of the, the implementation um, themselves. So instead of, let's say, and of course you'll hear more examples um, from colleagues uh, moving forward, uh, but instead of, let's say, um, us bringing in a contractor to fix a road, we would do that directly through the community if they had previously identified that as being a need, if it serves the community as a whole, um, and so on. And you'll find in the document these kind of specifications as well. Um, the document that you'll see, and again, given the fact that this is done through the Community Engagement Forum, but with the CCCM cluster, um, this is a global cluster guidance for CCCM. So, um, specifically for CCM practitioners, um, this is the document to refer to when implementing community-led projects globally. So when there's a need for a reference to understand a little bit better um, how to do this in whatever context, as a general rule, this is uh, the document to look at. Of course, Kristen will also mention this possibly. Um, an additional uh, very detailed document uh, that, that touches upon this is, uh, is the NRC community um, toolbox, uh, community engagement toolbox, which <clears throat> participation, sorry, which also goes through um, all of these aspects uh, and many others as well. So these two documents um, look at different aspects, but for the CCCM cluster globally, and again, um, implementing agencies, this would be the reference document. So I'll just walk you through a little bit what it contains. Um, <clears throat> the modality itself is a, a bit detailed and the, the uh, fact that it is one of the many, but one of the more important approaches to achieve participation in a meaningful manner. Then, um, as I mentioned, as this document um, looks at one of the most difficult modalities of uh, implementation of participation um, with the end goal being ownership. There's a very detailed portion of the document dedicated to challenges and um, precautions that can be taken to, to address the challenges that have been identified so far by those implementing CLPs. Um, some solutions to that and, and um, things to think about during planning and implementation. Then, of course, um, we're also presenting a little bit of guidance on how to hand over these kind of uh, projects. So essentially, um, there, of course, there are different stages of reaching um, the, the needed conditions to roll out a CLP with the community. Um, and some of those uh, stages may pre-imply potentially also having uh, implementation uh, done together with the community. So in that sense, there is uh, an aspect of handing over um, the projects themselves uh, to so, consider. So there's a guidance uh, piece on that. And of course, then transferring assets to the community. So um, the document looks at very particular technical aspects to consider. Um, then, of course, measuring impact and sustainability are also discussed. Thank you. Um, so to sum it up, this would be the document that we're discussing today. Um, again, as mentioned, 
the um, content of this, this, this global guidance now, um, has been formulated by practitioners because we have seen that in recent years there, there has been significant implementation and the usage of this modality. Now, it can take many forms. It's very, it's a, it's a very versatile type of um, approach. Um, so from that uh, perspective, I think it would be very good for you to also be exposed to some of the realities and some of the, the challenges and uh, um, specific situations that colleagues faced when implementing this. So with that, uh, if there are no questions at this time, I'll hand it back over to Kristen. Thanks very much. Um, um, that was a perfect introduction to to these practical examples. Um, and Walid is here, so I'll ask him to start um, giving us an example for how the community-led projects were implemented in Yemen. If that's OK, to start with you, Walid. Thank you so much, Christine. Apologies, I'm in transit. No uh, apologies for being late. Um, and um, this is the uh, second time I'm invited to speak in this forum. I'm, I'm very happy to be here again. Um, so and the last time we discussed over all the guidance that we did in, in Yemen and we touched very lightly upon how the uh, projects were implemented. Um, and this time to give you an example. <clears throat> and contextualize things a bit. As uh, Roxandra said, uh, this is an, an, a, participatory, a participatory approach to doing projects by uh, by handing over the actual uh, um, um, uh, executive and implementation uh, aspects of the projects to the community. So both the decision making, the identification, but also the implementation uh, through cash for work uh, modalities, and et, et cetera. Um, and one of the projects, and maybe to um, uh, to touch upon the uh, main issue we have in Yemen, which is HLP uh, related um, and disputed uh, ownership of um, of land. Uh, many of the projects that we've did we've done in Yemen relate to site improvements, so um, ideas that the community brought uh, forward to improve their uh, um, um, uh, shelters, uh, uh, latrines, uh, accessibility in the site, etc. Um, one of the projects was um, to uh, improve um, uh, transitional shelters that were put uh, 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 in, in place by uh, uh, shelter partners a while ago and to reinforce them uh, uh, um, with uh, metal sheets to be more flood resistant. And this was brought brought up by uh, the community again. Uh, it was piloted by one person in the in the community. It was uh, um, 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 it was already uh, tested for that site and it was in uh, in, in in southern uh, Taiz. Now the partner um, has um, agreed to fund the um, or to provide support, material support, and an engineer to also support with the technical aspects so in, in, in related to design, and um, and and the the materials were procured, etc. And, and and this was already discussed with the landlord, but the issue came up came came later about disputed uh, ownership, and another owner of the of the land um, uh, has stopped the uh, project. Now the project was was implemented in a small plot of land that was owned by one of the landowner, but stopped in in in, in uh, elsewhere. And this was not like a unique issue that came uh, uh, to our attention. It was um, something that happened over and over again. And uh, a way we're addressing this is uh, is basically looking at uh, uh, looking with HLP at uh, due diligence. So in 2022. We developed a due diligence for anything that relates to um, uh, works uh, insights related to building things, putting structures there, or, or rehabilitating things. Um, and uh, and luckily that was also something that uh, um, shelter was doing in 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 uh, in, uh, in, in, in guidance to their partners for transitional shelters in uh, in in one governorate in Marib. So we kind of um, uh, adopted that and harmonized it uh, across the board. So right now there are like eight simple steps 
that are done by our partner and in support of the HLP to okay to give us the green light whether we can do uh, a community-led project or not or mean I mean in general any structure in the site. So over back to you, Kristen. Sorry. No, great example. Thank you, Walid. Um, um, I have questions, and I'm sure other people have questions, but I think we'll uh, we'll just hear from. The, um, our different experts, and then we can uh, um, open the floor afterwards, if that's okay. Um, and uh, Henry, I have you next on my list. Um, also, um, can you please turn on your cameras, not just the speakers and myself, but everyone who can. Um, it's really nice to see faces. Uh, and also for the recording afterwards, if it's only me, that's all they will see throughout the whole session. <laughs> and I think... Uh, uh, people like some diversity. Thank you, guys. Please, Henry. Uh, thank you. for. Uh, it's good to actually have faces, actually. Uh, I didn't know Namir was actually on the call. Hi, Namir. How are you? So uh, uh, I would be talking about a few of the, my experience. Uh, I would also start with the tip sheet. Uh, for me, right now, the tip sheet came in handy because um, I recently moved to Somalia and I, I was actually focused on trying to uh, implement CLPs in Somalia with IM uh, Somalia and I had to develop a guidance document. Uh, I, I took heavily from the DMN guidance document and I also annexed uh, the tip sheet uh, because uh, one of the complaints that came up from, my, from the team was about la lack of having tools or guidance documents and also having a step-by-step -step checklist uh, to implement in a, a, CL, a CLP. Uh, so when I, when I started developing the guidance document, uh, I was really happy to see uh, something at the Yemen guidance document and also the tip sheet uh, in terms of discussing the challenges, uh, how to, to mitigate those challenges, and also asset transfer. If you work with IOM, you know there's so much uh, RMU issues with, with uh, Asset transfer, financial transfer. I'm still trying to bottle, uh, uh, bottleneck, but it was really easy, uh, helpful to have a tip sheet because annexing it to, to the documents was helpful to the team and also to explain to us. Can we come back to us? Henry? I will text him now. I'll attack him on, on several uh, media outlets. Oh, you, Henry, you froze. Yeah, you froze a bit, but you're with us again now. You were with us. Yes. Uh, oh. Hello. Hello. Yeah, we can hear you. Sorry, internet. Uh, so, uh, it's, I think it's still giving you a challenge. Henry? Give me a second. Okay. Give me a second. Let me try. Let me try to switch my internet. No problem. Um, in the meantime, I shared the, the tip sheet that we're referring to in the chat. And, um, and nice to see you, Walid. And, um, uh, also, there's a lot of um, links to relevant resources like the Yemen guidance that um, Henry is referring to and the um, uh, NRC's um, toolbox, the community coordination toolbox. All those links are in the tip sheet. Um, and currently we have the tip sheet in English, but um, it's there's the final touches now being done on um, the translations into Arabic and French. As well, so we'll be able to share that soon. Okay, I'm I'm back. Let's try this. I try to switch in. Let's try it. Internet. Yeah. Uh, okay. So uh, the tip sheet was really useful for me. Uh, I'm still I've not solved all my problems. I'm still trying to solve my problems with with IOM, but uh, I would figure that out. Uh, but uh, having done CL, CLPs in Nigeria, in Sudan, and now trying it in, in Somalia. 
uh, it's it's it has been great to have a reference document for people starting new. When you talk about uh, community engagement, when trying to try to talk about empowering uh, the displaced uh, to position making, it's always quite helpful to have these documents to reference. Uh, the community coordination toolkit. When I was in NRC, that was my my go to toolkit. Actually, uh, I still use it now. Uh, for 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 problem solving, problem identification. So it was really easy for me to fall back to this, those tools. Uh, in terms of when we were in Nigeria, when we were doing CLP with uh, skill acquisition for women, and we, we wanted to to develop uh, a training module for them in tailoring, in tie and dye, and other skill acquisition. It was difficult to explain to finance department on capacity building and asset transfer. And also developing an SOP. Uh, the community for the CCT tool came in handy there to develop an SOP uh, to train the team uh, on issue of capacity building. So it's it's basically very useful to have those templates, those tools, and the tip sheet. Uh, also in Sudan, when I was when we were working with youth groups in building a, a safe space, uh, a center for. For, for 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 them to have coordination center for them to learn skills. Uh, it was also useful to train my team. And it's also useful for asset transfer uh, because we were supposed to build and transfer these assets, this uh, youth center to the youth uh, uh, when I was in NRC in Sudan. So uh, using this tip sheet uh, would help actually. If I had the tip sheet then, it was because we didn't have the tip sheet then, uh, but we had to uh, the work with what we could have. There was many challenges we faced, uh, issues of uh, corruption, trust, uh, engaging stakeholders, because I keep saying it uh, in different contexts, the level of participations are different. In different societies you, you, you work with, you see that uh, it's difficult to work where there's no trust within communities when there are highly tribal issues. Uh, so you have to be manage expectations uh, know what you're doing uh, and also be realistic in terms of uh, uh, what you do, what you call CLP. I just actually came to that realization even this last week uh, when I had a meeting with RMU on why we were trying to have a CLP ideas, ideas here and on realistically certain things we cannot be done depending on organization policy, context, uh, depending on challenges you face. Uh, being able to fall back to those documents were useful to me. Uh, Thank you. Thanks so much. And uh, it's great that you're so practical in your examples. It's, it's very, very useful for all of us. Um, uh, Emmy and Idin, you're in uh, Mozambique and you've also uh, worked a lot with the community led projects there. So I'm going to hand over to you guys. Thanks, Christine. Thanks, everyone. Um, I think, uh, yeah, like like it was told before, we most of us know each other already in the previous uh, from the previous coffee chats. But just to introduce ourselves, I'm Amy, uh, working with um, CCCM Mozambique, and I'm joined by my colleague Idin, and uh, we have been um, we have been um, working on the CLPs together in Mozambique, uh, Cabo Delgado. Uh, at the moment, we have um, four different CLPs and uh, three of them are by coincidence uh, by the different communities are on the same topic. So we will focus on um, that one just to give you a bit of background on our CRP, CLPs and uh, how we took advantage of the tip sheet on the way and to prove you how the tip sheet is actually very useful um, because um, it is full of real um, real experience uh, from the from the practi practitioners. Um, so in Cabo Delgado, in the district called Monte Pues, uh, we are having CLPs on agriculture uh, in the displacement sites. Um, so as it, it is mentioned in the tip sheet, we have some preconditions for a CLP um, to start and also to be successful. Uh, and some of them are uh, having a, having already a strong community engagement with the communities and trust. Um, having the displacement stage um, a bit more friendly for long-term planning. 
um, and having a bit more stable population dynamics compared to very, um, very dynamic uh, environments, contextual environments. So uh, we had all of this in place for our CLPs. Um, and um, we followed an array-based approach. Uh, we are following an array-based approach in our CCCM uh, for that uh, for that play, like for that specific district. And our um, selection committee actually consists of uh, the community leaders, uh, but also the representatives from women's groups, uh, disability inclusion committees, youth committees, as well as host community representatives. Uh, which uh, was really important, as also again mentioned in the tip sheets, we always need to have uh, considerations for the host communities if the displacement site um, has some proximity to the host communities. Um, so in in our in our case, it was on agriculture because the communities um, selected to have something for food security and livelihoods at the same time, as it is one of the biggest needs at the moment in northern Mozambique. Um, and uh, there was some, uh, there were some active um, organizations responding to the needs, but specifically for those sites, um, they were not covered. So our CLP was a way for us to um, enhance coordination and communication with the with the clusters and bring some attention to the area on these topics. So there were some uh, organizations that were happy to support uh, the agricultural project from the from providing seeds and some other agricultural material side. So it helped uh, also strengthening the coordination in the area. Uh, and one thing that we highly emphasize in the tip sheet is that um, we need to um, evaluate and address preconditional challenges to start a CLP. Uh, and in our issue, in our in our, in our case, like Yemen, we had a huge HLP uh, consideration to start with, uh, because the land was land belongs to the private owners, and the uh, private owners were claiming um, either um, the assistance that humanitarian assistance that IDPs was receiving were receiving, or um, some parts of the harvest. Um, so in that stage, um, to identify the land that wouldn't lead further HLP um, disputes, uh, we involved um, loc uh, local authorities. And also to mention that one of the reasons why we choose this district to start CLPs was our already very much functioning relationship with the local authorities, which, which is a huge plus for a CLP to be successful. Um, and in that stage, um, local authorities got involved and they found the communities to identify a land that wouldn't cause an HRP, um, HRP issue. Uh, and they were also very helpful in terms of identifying um, the uh, any other pro potential problem that can be um, that can that can happen and uh, putting measures in place to to avoid those. Now I'm gonna. Uh, give the floor to Eden to continue. Oh, uh, thank you. Following what uh, Amy was presenting, so uh, in order to uh, mitigate the risk of tensions and the conflicts, uh, we actively involved uh, those communities and allocating them 20% of the lands and the system to them. Additionally, uh, the host committee representatives were integrated in the management committees to ensure uh, the inclusivity and the represent representation. So to, in order to overcome the barriers to engagement, um, a special consideration was given to the marginalized groups, such as uh, persons with disabilities and uh, the elderly. So the involvement spanned from the initial identifications and implementation of issues to also implementation of the activity. In allocating lands, we ensure uh, the proximity of uh, for ease access and the convenience. So, for ensuring the self sustainability uh, to foster the sustainability with the CRPs, we provide them technical trainings and encourage them to reserving some parts of the production so that they can uh, produce the next seasons. 
and, and we collaborated also with the local authorities and the experts. Additionally, uh, the community took ownership by the marketing the the marketing the land, cleaning and preparing pre preparing also the land by themselves. Yeah, one of the main purposes for us to have a CRP that can be um, self um, sustaining after our involvement with the project um, ends. Um, that's why we really gave a big emphasis on sustainability. So everything that we have mentioned here, uh, starting from the deciding how to start a CRP, involvement of the local authorities, involvement of the host communities, plus potential challenges like HLP, um, involvement of the disadvantaged groups, um, all of them and sustainability of CRPs, all of them are mentioned in the tip sheet in a very practical way um, for anyone who is interested in starting a CRP to identify potential challenges to mitigate them before uh, taking an action and also challenges that can uh, that can uh, happen during the during the CRPs themselves and how to mitigate those as well. This is from our side. Um, so, Christine, over to you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, it's it's super useful to hear how you were addressing the challenges and, and preempting them as well. Sometimes, um, I see Mika is here. This is great. We weren't sure you could make it, Mika. Um, I'm going to hand over to you as our final expert before we'll open the floor to the rest of you and, and your questions. So that's my thank, dog. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christine. Uh, sorry, I can't uh, put on my camera uh, where I am. The internet is uh, weak. So uh, when I'm coming in, can I also then uh, uh, bring in the issues from Nigeria as well? So that I can make of my course, contribution yes. at one. All Please right. do. Yeah, th thank you, thank you, MND Dean, for for uh, uh, correctly putting what 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 we have done on COPs in uh, in Mozambique, and uh, the the importance of the tip sheet. So um, I need to highlight that this this tip sheet has been uh, of uh, great importance to us, and um, I, I need to highlight that uh, uh, the challenges that that are being tackled through COPs. In uh, in Mozambique, um, are quite interesting. Uh, the issues of uh, food security, which the communities decided to 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 tackle, mainly because they they have been delisted from uh, from general food distributions. So they they opted to to go for food security related projects so that they could uh, 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 provide their 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 own food. So. It, it, it's like really tackling uh, very very critical needs in the in the communities, and uh, I need to I need to highlight that uh, uh, stakeholder mapping uh, came came out very very important for for the COPs in uh, in Mozambique because uh, in in tackling the the challenges that the community that identified most of the issues that uh, that that were being dealt with were beyond CCCM. So the actions that that came out from the from the community plans, action plans. They they depended on on other stakeholders. So from the government side, we we needed uh, support from uh, the uh, the agency that uh, deals with land uh, called STPI. So we we had uh, Edin um, uh, teaming up with STPI in terms of uh, identifying the land demarcations and. Uh, and also ascertaining uh, land ownership issues and uh, making all the negotiations. Then, uh, as uh, Amy has rightly put, the issue of the food security cluster as well. So they they came in handy as well in terms of linking us with a with a partner who could provide the the, the inputs. And we also had uh, a government agency called uh, Sidai that um, provided the the training on agriculture to the to the communities. So these these linkages were were really necessary. Uh, and all that came from the uh, stakeholder mapping. So I think uh, it's a very important step that we need to to do uh, to 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 really map the the stakeholders so that you know we 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 can have projects that uh, that succeed. Um, so so in terms of the tip sheet, I think this it, it really came on handy uh, by providing this uh, this uh, step by step uh, in our approach. So we, we, we may need actually for the tip sheet, we may need uh, more linkages in the tip sheet, like linkages to the tools, so that when they're mentioning 
any particular tools so we we have like a link where someone can can just go directly to particular tools and be able to read for themselves you know like some uh, what some other like uh, tip sheets uh, uh, have so that's uh, that's for 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 Mozambique so for Mozambique particularly we need to highlight the issue of uh, of the work that uh, that is being done on COPs that links directly to durable uh, solutions, but I will not dwell much on that. Then uh, for for Nigeria, I have my my other colleagues from Nigeria on the line, and we're working also with uh, with Henry as well. Uh, for for Nigeria, we we prioritized um, issues uh, to do with drainage. The communities had identified because the camps were were having a challenge of for flooding during the rain season. So they prioritized issues of drainage. They also prioritized issues of waste management as well because they, the waste management was poor in the sites. They felt that the waste management was poor in the sites, so they wanted to dig some waste disposal pits. So for, for Nigeria, we, it was purely voluntary work where the, the communities um, were just given tools and they dug waste disposal pits. They used dug waste disposal pits and then also dragged some, um, some drainage ch channels on a... On a more, can I say, uh, which way, which were not like a very, which were not very labor intensive, so but they were able to organize themselves and uh, and uh, and uh, do this. So there was no cash for work. So usually, such such projects you do them through cash for work, where you engage uh, the communities and give them some cash and for them to provide this labor. But for Nigeria in uh, in uh, 2020 2021, uh, we had community we had some some sites. Where the communities were just provided tools and they were able to 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 do to do this work. So for Nigeria, I need to highlight particularly the importance of the coaching. Coaching was was really important because this was at the peak of COVID, and um, you know access to the to sites was uh, was uh, very limited, and the work that we could do was very limited. So coaching came came really handy in Nigeria for the small team that we had assigned to do the community-led projects. So the, the coaching guidelines really came in handy. And uh, it's, it's really important to appraise uh, uh, ourselves with these coaching guidelines. And especially there was also a, a video tutorial as well on, on coaching. So I think all these resources need to be referenced in the, in the, in the, in the, in the tip sheet. So there's need for, for someone when he's going through the tip sheet then to be able just to be um, linked directly to to all these um, to all these uh, resources. Then for 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 Mozambique, uh, besides the food security projects, uh, we we have something going on as well on vocational training, more or less limited to uh, linked to what Henry uh, re reported on um, on training for women. So we have some some youths that were trained by other organizations that have uh, different artisanal skills. Uh, that are ready to uh, provide uh, training to other youths in the in the sites, um, provided they get uh, support in terms of tools and uh, construction of a like a community center where they can do the the skills. So CCCM uh, came in with the with the with the tools, purchasing the tools and uh, supporting in terms of construction of the community center that uh, that uh, that. Uh, that will be used for for this training. So this is uh, is currently ongoing. Um, so we'll be able to share the results of this uh, after some uh, after we've implemented it in uh, in two or three or three months time. So we need to highlight that in all this, um, they, it's a, it's a voluntary as well. And um, it, it, rather than a, a, being in a case whereby you have to take someone to a college where they go through vocational training and you have to pay the teachers, you have to pay uh the transportation and all that and lodgings probably for people if the vocational facilities are not close to the to the site in this case we have the idps training each other in the site um uh, uh, use utilizing a training that they were given by by another organization so uh all these are uh, also linkages in terms of the of the nexus as well because uh we we are linking up with uh, with the partners that uh, that are working in development, uh, that are working in development, whilst we are working in humanitarian, and we are bringing all these uh, all these uh, 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 interventions uh, together. 
So we have a partner working in vocational training, uh, which has provided the training, and we are we are we are we are augmenting that training, replicating that training, um, and the same applies even for this uh, food security as well project. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's it's these linkages as well around the nexus and the partners that are working in different sectors, and then we are we are we are we are we are, we are uh, harnessing all those uh, you know uh, capacities, and then. Uh, 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 using them to to benefit uh, the the community. So uh, this is a, a one of the of the approaches that we have adopted, and I'm sure Amy has got a lot to share on that because there are so many opportunities around the community the community projects that that would need to give so that you know we can address most of these uh, challenges that are that are in the communities. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mika. I'm taking a lot of notes. It's uh, brilliant points on all the linkages and uh, uh, both with the with the the development and the the local partners and the nexus and and I also made note of of um, the um, the tools that you want links to in the tip sheet. Um, so thank you. I'm going to open the floor for people who may have questions to any of you. Um, you can. Uh, Unmute yourself or you can raise a hand, whatever you're comfortable with. Um, please go ahead. Or you can put it in the chat and I can ask for you. Um, Ingrid, please go ahead. It's a little bit difficult to hear you. Okay, very good. Yeah, sorry. Oh, okay, yeah. can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. That it was super interesting to hear from colleagues in in different contexts and uh, i'm following keenly on the discussion and i'm seeing like as more and more this is really like our priority for ccm right like community engagement uh this morning i was just coming from a regional discussion on localization you know how the that is uh, a priority as well in the agenda so i'm seeing like maybe the community chat uh, coffee can be after Ramadan, but this can be like an ongoing discussion on CLPs. I see some colleagues uh, from Ukraine has joined. So I'm uh, from Ukraine mission now, currently in Geneva, and I see also Johannes from Bangladesh. So I'm also interested how colleagues like uh, in, in the tip sheets, there are different contexts which were phrased in the challenges. So how the evolving challenges like um, like for previous discussion, I think WPP women's participation have presented um, from different um, country offices and missions. And it would be interesting to see like in terms of example in Bangladesh, it started in 2017 and how it has continued, right? So I, I see in the tip sheet there is on sustainability. And oh, who was it saying? Was it well, he like the practical ones, like institutional support, <laughs> like yeah, those things? So how these uh, country offices or colleagues have managed to advocate that the the agency organizations, um, uh, in terms of backstop support, is also present, and um, in in Bangladesh, how we managed to mainstream uh, community led project, as uh, Roxandra was saying uh, when uh, mentioning the tip sheet, the community participation in the minimum standards is a core, right? It's one of the pillars of the minimum standards So how we can advocate that to our administrative resource management perspective. So I think this forum uh, with your experiences, with sharings from colleagues, the success stories um, can also be uh, shared. So uh, I, I'm seeing that this can be a continuing in engagement. And secondly and last, um, I, I remember Jacqueline, like we have this case studies, right? And I'm sure many of your stories have been in this case study. So I think the engaged community engagement forum can contribute uh, to this um, case studies in the global cluster uh, to feature um, this um, success stories, practices mm -hmm. that we can learn. Yeah, I, I mentioned about the uh, colleagues in Ukraine because like our challenge there and also the interesting context like you, the site management is remote, right? So we we work with our site managers, uh, Kirillo, Katerina, they're here from Ukraine. So uh, how 
you you deal with that. So in the tip sheet, we can see some um, helpful uh, and if the colleagues have also managed to do remote site management and engage with the community at the same time through the CLP. So that would be super interesting. So thanks all so much. Back to you, Kristen. Thanks very much. And as you were on your second point, as you were talking, I was trying to find our um, um, the community engagement form has a very short template for uh, written case studies on community led projects um, that I'll share here again. It's for anyone to to fill out who wants to share their experience, whether it's some challenges that were overcome or not um, and how they address them. Um, so we can continue to to share experiences like this um, um, on different community led projects. Um, uh, you can send them to me if you want me to have a look at them before they're shared on the um, on the website, or you can just post them directly as as you wish. Um, so that's one thing we can do. I don't know if you want uh, any of the um, any of these experts to address this um, the question you had on the sustainability, um, and if there's any uh, volunteers among the four of you to talk about sustainability of the community led projects. Have you had a chance to? Um, do you have, have you had enough time? Have you had a, a chance to see any? Um, Henry, yes, please go ahead. Uh, actually, uh, Ingrid, you, you, you do have a very good question, actually, uh, for because this was the same uh, discussion I was having with Amelia and our WPP colleagues, actually, to see how we could have imp major impact and sustainability in the long run. Uh, for, for me, I have some ideas. I've not really, like, uh, Christian said, uh, measured, uh, looked at sustainability until now. Uh, we we are looking at in Somalia how we could uh, link our WPP our women empowerment project towards into a more durable solution. Uh, we do have this consortium we are in with AFD, an AFD funded consortium with UNSCR UN Women. Um, my idea was to link uh, these participants and beneficiaries to to UN Women to refer them to UN Women funded projects, which is for five years. Uh, after after relocation, after the integration, actually, and uh, to see if uh, there is a kind of sustainability, a more, a more longer term solution built for them. Uh, so because uh, I CLP funded by CCCM is mostly an emergency temporary funding. Uh, we mostly have maximum one year projects, so it's often hard for for us to think about sustainability. It's mostly uh, the reason why I'm even having this discussion is because I. I am in a consortium with durable solution partners who are discussing five, 10 years uh, ideas. So he gave me this idea to refer them, this case flow that I have, after we finish our six months project, our six, uh, six to, I don't know, September project, to a more longer term durable solution okay, uh, partner to take them over and see how they can sustain this response. So this is my own input. Thank you. Thanks very much for answering that, Henry. Um, Emmy and Nadine, do you have a, an example as well? Yeah, I I wanted to add, I think the, like, the critical part of CLP is, is ownership. Uh, how you make the communities really own the project um, is very much linked to the sustainability of the project. And I think one thing to differentiate is having a project more community based is different than having a community led project. These are, I think, two different things that also we should differentiate um, conceptually because in CLPs, what we want is not only having the community voice, but rather communities to have the full ownership and full leadership of the project, which sometimes might include failures. It cannot be all the time success, but also making communities get ready for these failures and how they can uh, go through these failures is, I think, is a very important part of CLPs. We haven't done that as proper as Tom suggested, but in one of the previous community chats that uh, we had, how like in Tom's se session, how we can think about failures in advance and how we can advance, um, address them in advance is something that actually should be part of CRPs, uh, I believe, because you need to mitigate what can go wrong and how as a community 
they would like to address it when it happens is a really important uh, part of SDLP. And uh, and I guess um, we are talking about it in the tip sheet, I think quite a lot as well. CLPs need flexibilities from the organization's side. Uh, sometimes it can go beyond the project timelines. It can go beyond the project budgets. It can go beyond what you are going to report under an indicator um, or unexpected things can happen. For example, in our um, youth project that Mika mentioned, youth CLP project, the initial idea that the community decided to build the uh, senators for production themselves, which was really positive for us because it's very like uh, high ownership, sign of high ownership. But then the security situation has changed and youth was scared of going to the bush to uh, collect materials to build the, build the center themselves. So we needed to come in to, to help with the provision of the materials. They are still building it themselves, but provision of materials from our side. So it's required a bit of flexibility from our side. And as well as if it's a livelihood project, it's usually a bit too optimistic to expect a success in a very short period of time. And uh, probably as an organization, we need to get ready for a maybe second support if it's needed to make sure that um, to make sure that we can keep it sustainable. But also, I think making communities ready for failures and again, owning the failure is really key to make sure that um, CLPs can sustain themselves. Thank you. Thanks. Um, very well said. Um, do anyone else have any questions for our experts here? Check the chat. Just raise your hand or speak out. Um, we have four minutes left, and I'm happy to stay on. Um, um, and whoever wants to stay on can stay on as well. But we will not be upset if uh, we know that people have busy days. So if you have to leave, you have to leave. Um, any last questions? I really wanted to ask you about. Um, uh, the actual handover of assets. Um, if there's been any problems around um, uh, the kind of community aspect of that, how do you hand it over? Do you hand it over to committees? Do you hand it over to other? Like, have, have you actually done it, or have you have you planned it? Um, yeah, and any of you. Has it been money? Has it been assets? Has it been machines? OK, uh, let me go first. Uh, yes, please. I need to drop my exactly for uh, with NRC. Uh, I've done handover assets. Uh, uh, it was uh, in Nigeria, even in Sudan. Uh, you have to, first of all, understand uh, your, your context, actually. If there is if there's corruption, if there's trust, if it's a also the homogeneity of your of the displaced community also matters. Uh, so in, in context where you have a very homogeneous uh, community, or, or it's much, much easier for, for them to have trust within the committee. If you have, mostly I prefer to work with, with, commit, with committees and community uh, uh, with a clear defined structure. So if you hand over to a, a, a committee, which is responsible to manage these assets, it's it's much easier when you have uh, a, a chair, a secretary, whatever, with a clear defined TOR. When you have a clear defined TOR and a, an SOP and a donation certificate, and also looking at each organization's uh, policy, uh, so uh, it, it's easy. So for, in in Nigeria, we donated assets. Uh, in in Sudan, it was it was the building we built. Uh, we 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 rehabilitated and built. So depending on the on uh, organization policy, uh, the value of what you are donating. So there are different levels to, to these things. So it, 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 it's quite, diff you have to understand your context. Uh, why, if you are working in a context where it's very uh, divided, it's difficult actually. Here right now in Somalia, uh, even though we have the committee, we are trying to work with local authorities to endorse the committee because in uh, case of dispute, we are trying to transfer risk from IOM if the dispute uh, because we, we are trying to donate uh, certain materials, cash uh, for for rehabilitation, and also cash to to have a 
to set up a, a sports competition. So we are having a TOR, we are having several documents according to RMU's uh, rules, and also bringing in local authorities to be uh, to be a, a stakeholder in it. And in case of disagreement, in case of uh, any issues, the local authority could step in. Yeah, they have to endorse the committee. The, the committee have to be a member of the committee and also have a clear responsibility. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Henry. D does anyone else want to add? Uh, Walid, yes. So Walid wants, yep, go first. <laughs> Sorry, Amy, go. I can wait. Okay. okay. Uh, I just wanted to add, uh, Henry, yes, uh, usually handover is and like in any project is done to the what they call the senior user or the people who will actually benefit uh, from the project. And it's just for us in Yemen also, uh, we have discussed this with partners and, and we like learning from experience. And it's usually um, uh, most beneficial to think about handover at the initial stage of planning, because most of the projects are usually to improve an existing service. So it's um, it might be related to water, in which case we need to ensure that authorities that are um, uh, responsible for maintaining some of the supply of the water to this project have to commit to continue doing it. It's also uh, always involving, like Henry said, the authorities that are responsible for site administration because they also have the uh, roles and responsibilities of uh, and, uh, you know managing this program of small little CLP projects. Yes, the ownership goes back to uh, community and their uh, the main stakeholder, but also um, uh, specific authorities have to be there to ensure the maintenance of of the project. Thank you, Emmy. Yeah, I just was going to say something very similar to what Walid said. Um, I believe having an inclusive initial stages really helps these things to um, these things to be planned in advance. Well, uh, like like he said, having local authorities initial stages uh, buying the pro like the, having their buy in in the project, but also making sure that the project is inclusive of different groups in the community, not only serving one community, which is sometimes challenging for some certain CRPs, but um, being as in inclusive as possible, uh, having different disadvantaged marginalized groups, but also uh, sometimes one risk that I think is associated with that when we focus on marginalized group, uh, groups way too much on a CLP, it sometimes might lead to um, further risks for this group or even uh, tensions within the community. So that's why understanding the context is very, very important. But uh, being as inclusive as possible in the initial stages definitely help, I think, these things to be mitigated in the later stages. Thanks, Emilia. There's another question here in the in the chat, um, 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 it's uh, uh, Toshev Magdalena. Um, yes, do you want to ask it directly? Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. And it's really nice to see familiar faces, but also to meet you all. Thank you for the amazing uh, um, op opportunity and also presentations. It's really helpful uh, to hear from you all. Uh, my question is um, basically if you have any examples um, with uh, community led projects that are implemented through micro grants, um, basically directly providing specific small grants to the communities uh, in specific structures uh, that you um, either have implemented or you have the technical knowledge to also to respond on that. Um, just asking because we are also in a current stage of similar implementation here in Turkey in the earthquake response that we are um, similarly implementing community led projects uh, through direct uh, implementation within IOM, but also with the local partners. And it is really helpful to hear uh, from you this wonderful examples that are, are really insightful. Um, and that's why I wanted to ask because we are uh, considering also um this micro grant uh, um, uh, perspective and modality uh since it is something that it has been already implemented but 
I wanted to hear also from your um, uh, your experience if there is uh, anything that you could uh, suggest or you have something uh, specific in mind. Thank you. And I don't know if it is very clear. It is clear or uh, you need uh, a bit more uh, to elaborate on the question. Thank you. Um, Henry had to leave us, but uh, Walid and Emmy and Mika, if you're still here, do any of you have um, this? There was another um, um, practitioner who was saying um, that in Syria we've implemented a community led projects um, related to vocational training and startup micro grants. It's um, uh, Dubel Tamam, so maybe you can uh, answer this question. Yes, thank you so much. This is Tamam from BCCM cluster in uh, Syria. Yes, uh, we have implemented this uh, project for the implementing the community led projects uh, related to the vocational training and uh, also after that with the startup and micro grants to the participants. Uh, we may have a bilateral uh, meeting uh, while both, uh, you know, that operating from uh, Turkey and uh, elaborate more about the project and uh, the results. Thank you. And then you can use that um, um, case study um, uh, to the, the case study template to share with the rest of us your experiences. Because we yes, also sure. want to hear about it. And sure. um, Mika, you raised your hand. Oh, and then Emmy. Yeah, in terms of the um, of micro grants, I think uh, I would also uh, advise Magdalena to to get in touch with uh, the uh, uh, IOM uh, community based planning team. So they they do a lot of that these community based micro grants. So after going through a community based uh, planning uh, process so it's 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 kind of uh, uh, similar to to community led projects though it's different like it, it focuses on purely development by coming up with development priorities for a community and so forth so if you if you get in touch with uh, the TRD uh, division of IOM uh, should be transition recovery di di division of IM. They should be able to to share with you uh, 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 information related to that. That the number of projects that were implemented by by NRC, by by IOM in Somalia, in Zimbabwe, Afghanistan, um, Iraq, so many countries uh, that have implemented these are uh, these are uh, community based uh, projects. But they 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 really vary from country to country. Um, and uh, uh, it, the, the the process is more is more laborious, and uh, 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 you, you you need the the community to to come up like with plans. You tell them the the budget that is there, and you need them to to come up with with uh, with plans on how to utilize that money based on the priorities in their in their in their area. And you have to support them in putting like accountability measures for the for the money as well to address issues of uh, of corruption. So you need to to support them through the whole process, and also support them in terms of putting community-based monitoring uh, mechanisms and so forth. So you need to support them on the accountability, putting place community-based monitoring mechanisms for the project and things like that. Interesting. Uh, um, I hope it's helpful. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so it is. It is very helpful. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for the responses. It is helpful. Yes, thank you. Sure. Um, yeah, I think it's something that we can um, come back to in the future as well when uh, people have more experience um, testing it out and see how it went for you. Um, and we can come back to um, uh, the Syria CCM cluster as well and learn from their um, experiences. Uh, Emmy and uh, uh, Idin. Yeah, I will just quick, quickly say that, Magda, by the way, it's really nice to see you. I will just quickly say that I think while approaching to CLPs, it's very important not to have a preset agenda except the modalities like um like micro grants can be a modality but it shouldn't be the purpose because purpose should be identified by the community themselves uh but if it's gonna be the modality it's really good that if it's really really identified well 
within its limitations because I mean also organizational limitations and things to be careful about and it should be really stated in the selection uh, process like to the select, uh, selection committee. Also, that's something that we talk about in the in the tip sheet. We need to give the give the frame that we can work in very well uh, to the selection committee for them to uh, make a selection accordingly. So if uh, if you can only support a modality of micro grants, um, it should be really clearly communicated with them before they go through any identification or prioritization of the problem. Uh, but micro grants shouldn't be the end point, but the modality because for CLPs it should be totally up to the community what they um, what they want to choose. Perfect, thank you. Um, do anyone else have any questions? Um, I know we're going way over time, but uh, I'm enjoying the discussions. <laughs> um, I will be following up with them, all you presenters on the uh, on the guidance. So, Walid, you were saying that you had a um, uh, you developed the due diligence um kind of SOPs or steps um and uh, Henry was also mentioning that they had developed uh, like country specific guidance for uh, um community led projects in Somalia so all these all these documents if you're able to share them that would be amazing just as examples it's always useful to to have examples um for um, for any kind of documents that might be useful to um for the other practitioners so I'll follow up with you and um, we can gather them and not share it with the recording of this session. If that's OK. Um, yeah, if there's no other questions, um, I'd like to thank uh, Walid and Emmy and Edine and Mika and Henry who had to leave us and uh, Roxandra as well. Everyone who contributed with questions and comments. Thanks so much. And um, we still we have the the community led project um, hashtag um, alive and kicking on the on the forum website where you can continue to ask questions and share resources as well. Um, if you go in there on the forum website, you'll find all discussions, all the previous discussions and resources that have been shared. So um, yeah, please keep it going and keep sharing and um, have a great Easter and uh, Ramadan Karim. And uh, Bye bye, everyone. Thanks so much. Bye, bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Have a great day.